Hello and welcome to another in the Armchair Teaching Series. I have entitled this talk today, Does God Really Want to Be a Father to You? Now there's two ways to have a child. One is where you have a child naturally. Um, you know what I mean. The other way is to adopt. The first way you, you get what you get. You have no choice in the matter. The child could be a boy or a girl. It could be an introvert or an extrovert, etc. Adoption is different. Before adopting you get the full history. You get the good, the bad and the ugly. There are no surprises. See, God the Father knows who you are. He knows your full history, the good, the bad and, yes, the ugly. Nothing hidden, no surprises, except one. The surprise is that knowing you and knowing me, he deeply desires you and I to be his child, that we would call him Abba, Father. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans 8, 15. He said, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Listen to what Jesus said in John 1.12, But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. You see, God not only wants you in his family forever, he has actively pursued you. He leads your steps to Jesus. Listen again to what Jesus said in John 6.43, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So there you have it. Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, omnipotent one, deeply desires that he and you would have a father and child relationship. He knew and still knows all about you, the lot. He sent Jesus to make the one and only way for you to be able to come to him. He drew you to Jesus. He adopted you. You're of unimaginable value to him. In a world where rejection is commonplace, that's hard to grasp, isn't it? But it's true. And if you're struggling to take that truth on board, there's more. And to help you grasp this more, I need to tell you a story. Well, actually, several stories. They help me understand, so I trust they'll help you. Uh, my father died a decade ago. Uh, my mum sold up all that they owned in their rented house, and it raised just enough money to buy a small semi-detached bungalow where she very happily saw out the remainder of her days. When she died, she left a simple will. Her only possession, the little pensioner bungalow, was to be sold and the money divided equally between her three children. After expenses, there was £24,000 left. The solicitor handling the will called myself and my two sisters to her office, sat us down in front of her desk and said, Well, you're all joint heirs. In other words, what I got as the firstborn son my sister Sharon got, what Sharon got, my sister Jill got. In other words, Mum made no difference whatsoever between us. Then I remembered a verse of scripture that I had never really taken note of before. And when I turned it up again in the book of Romans, I was shocked. It was the follow-on from Paul telling us that as adopted children we could call God our Father, Abba. Here's what Paul wrote in full, Romans 8, 15-17. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cried, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. In the book of Galatians, uh, where Paul was writing to church members in Galatia, he described us as heirs with Christ. But here, writing to the early church members in Rome, he expands on that and calls us joint heirs with Jesus. Joint heirs with Jesus the Christ? Yes. You see, you're called into the family of God to be a joint heir with Jesus. How is that for a destiny? This means that God's making no difference between adopted you and his only begotten son. No difference. John seventeen twenty three. Jesus said, I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Let me give you an example of God's heart for you in this matter. Where is Jesus seated right now? Well, he's seated enthroned at the right hand of the Father, at the right hand of our Father who is in heaven. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, this is Ephesians 1, 20 to 21, says he raised him, as Jesus, from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. No theological surprises there. We, we understand that, but here's the surprise. You might be firmly nailed to this planet for three score years and ten or whatever, but in position... God the Father has placed you positionally next to him, seated in heavenly places, because you are in Christ. 
Paul, just four verses later, unpacked this to the church. Ephesians chapter 2, 4 to 6 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Then it says in brackets, By grace you've been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You in Christ and Christ in you, inseparable. One in spirit joined with the Lord. Where he is, there you shall be also. Could God draw you any closer himself? Right next to himself in Christ. God the Father called his only begotten Son beloved. What a tender word to use. It says, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is Matthew 3.17. So if he calls Jesus beloved, it follows that if you're a joint heir with Jesus, he would tenderly call you beloved as well. Does he? Oh yes, indeed he does. Again and again and again, God's Spirit called Uh, caused the apostles to speak that tender word of love to his children. Here's just a few examples from more than 50 times the word beloved is used to believers, individually or corporately as the body. Try saying beloved some 50 times to get the point God is making. Romans 1, 7, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Romans 12, 19, beloved, do not avenge yourselves. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, therefore having these promises, beloved. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, beloved by the Lord. Beloved by the Lord. Jude one twenty. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Singapore teacher Joseph Prince rightly points out that when the devil was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, he carefully, deliberately omitted one word of what the Father had said about Jesus at the River Jordan just days earlier. Remember what the Father said about Jesus? He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But Satan did not say to Jesus, if you're the beloved son of God. Instead, he said, if you're the son of God. That's a big difference. You see, when Satan comes against you, he will always omit the word beloved. If he reminded you of your place in your father's heart, then his power to heap condemnation on you for your failures would be broken. Remember that. And remember this. Beloved, you really are beloved. So be loved. Here's the next story. A well-known evangelist uh, had one natural boy. He and his wife decided to adopt another teenage boy. Uh, How brave is that? They assured the nervous young man that he was now and forever a full member of the family. No difference between him and the natural son. No difference. But no matter how well and how often this was explained, it was obvious that this truth was only head knowledge to the young man rather than heart knowledge. I'm sure we could all identify with the young man. It's a lot to take in. Anyway, teenagers eat a lot, and in the middle of the night, the parents would hear a bedroom door open and footsteps heading downstairs and into the kitchen. Then they would hear cornflakes being poured into a bowl, the fridge opening and closing as milk was lifted out and poured over the cereal. Then they would hear the bowl being thrown into the sink along with the spoon for mum to wash up in the morning. Then the footsteps uh, heading back upstairs and finally the bedroom door being closed. Then silence. Until perhaps 30 minutes later, then he would hear another bedroom door opening quietly. Footsteps creeping down the stairs, stopping for a moment every time one of the stairs creaked loudly. They heard the kitchen door opening quietly. They knew the fridge door was being opened but they couldn't hear that. They could just make out the sound of a bowl being lifted down from a cupboard shelf just make out the sound of cornflakes being gently slid from their box into the bowl. They could hear the sound of the bowl and spoon being washed and moments later being set carefully back onto the cupboard shelf. Finally they would hear the gentle careful steps heading back up to the bedroom and the door being closed ever so slowly and quietly. The parents said it broke their heart. But one night they heard two bedroom doors opening, two sets of footsteps clattering down the stairs, two bowls, two cornflake feeds and two bowls and two spoons being thrown into the sink for mum to wash up in the morning. Finally, two sets of noisy footsteps returning to two bedrooms. And the parents cried with joy. At last the young man understood. Your heavenly father has declared that you and Jesus are joint heirs. We acknowledge this immense statement with a polite nod of our heads. Can you imagine how our Heavenly Father longs for you to grasp his heart's intent for you? Let's look at this strange word, Abba, for a moment. It's not an English word, but originally an Aramaic word, which became part of the Hebrew language. 
I can think of no easier way to explain it than this. Go to any city in the West and people watch for a while. Imagine for a moment a father and child walking past hand in hand. The child wants an ice cream. Daddy, the child says, can I have an ice cream? Now imagine doing the same in Jerusalem. Only this time you hear the child saying, Abba, can I have an ice cream? You see, Abba is just a personal term for father. Daddy. If a stranger came to my house, one of my children opened the door, the stranger might say, can I speak to your father, uh, please? My child would turn and shout back into the home saying, Daddy, there's someone here to see you. The stranger calls me father, my child calls me daddy. In the Old Testament, the Israelites knew God as Yahweh. In fact, so distant did God seem to them that they would only use the letters Y-H-W-H. Imagine the shock then when the disciples first heard Jesus talk to uh, Y-H-W-H and refer to him as Abba Father, as joint heirs. Let's look at our written invitation to call God the Father Abba as Jesus did. Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba Father. Galatians 4, 6 said, And because your sons God sent forth the spirit of a son into your hearts, crying out, Abba Father. I used to think there were some passages in the Bible that God just didn't come out too well in. I would never have said that out loud, of course, but sometimes I thought it. Here's one example. Jesus told this story and he was clearly speaking about his father. Uh, publishers usually give a descriptive title above this story such as a friend calls at midnight. Anyway, in Luke 11, 5 to 8, Jesus says to his listeners, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Jesus immediately went on to say, Luke 11, 9 to 10, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. Now, I could understand this call to be persistent in prayer, and that is certainly one of the several lessons that Jesus was giving to his listeners. But I confess I didn't like the idea of being locked outside the Father's house and only being able to get his uh, brief attention when I persisted in banging on his door. Then I read what Ken Gear wrote about this story in his book, Moments with the Saviour, A Devotional Life of Christ. And I saw it. Oh, how I saw it. It was a friend knocking at the door. Where were the children? They were inside the house, safely tucked up in bed with their father. He briefly answered the friend's persistent knock, but then hurried back to his children. That was a different viewpoint altogether. You see, in the ancient Middle East, the houses were easy to break into. Remember the crippled man's friends uh, breaking open the roof to lower their crippled friend down on the rope so that he would be in front of Jesus. There was no phone system to call the police if your home was broken into. The safe place at night was being safely tucked up in bed with your big strong daddy there to protect you. Uh, remember the reason why the father was so hesitant to come down. Do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. You see, I had always believed in God and in Jesus Christ as only begotten son. I had said prayers every night of my life since I was three years of age. Sometimes I would pray for up to an hour on my knees at night. I attended church every Sunday. I took communion. I hosted a cell group in my house every fortnight. But Jesus was not my Lord. I was the master or the Lord of my life. He was more like a nice Facebook friend. There were a few secret sins that I had no intention at that stage of turning away from. So the best term I could use to describe myself then was a, a quiet fan of God. But now I'm his child, his son, and I'm safely inside my father's house. I only have to whisper, Abba, and I know I have his ear. Here's the mystery now revealed. The door to the father's house is a person, Jesus. John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out to find pasture. And on August the 11th, 1989, I entered my father's house through that door. There are many times I feel the need to persist in prayer over one situation or another, but never do I feel like the friend locked outside anymore. I'm in my dad's house and I'm safe and so are you. Now time to stop and reflect. Are you truly wanted by God? 
Did he have to chase? Did he have to? Did you have to chase after God, or did God come looking for you? Are you viewed as a second-rate child in his family, or a full family member with all the rights and privileges of a true family member? Have you grasped the truth that Lord God Almighty invites you, his child, to join Jesus in calling him daddy or dad? Have you ever understood what the term joint heir means? As a child of God, are you inside the house or outside? Are you beloved? Really, really his beloved? And the big question, will you let yourself be loved by God? By the way, this teaching is an extract from chapter 8, my book, Love Like Never Before. I pray it has uh, encouraged you greatly if you've been somewhat nervous about drawing close to God the Father through Jesus. Anyway, amen and God bless.